What, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he that condemns? It is Christ who died and furthermore is also risen. Who is even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Yet in these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? Amen. And uh, I, I just want to talk to you for a few minutes tonight from this reading. And I'm going to talk to you about say something. Everybody say, say something. Come on, say, say it. Say something. Yeah, say something. Say something. Say something. You're not waiting on me because I'm I'm waiting on y'all to say to say it. I'm gonna I want to try to get you here tonight and and uh, hopefully bring some things to you um, that I, I believe will bless you if you'll listen and allow it to. H how many of you believe tonight that there are some predetermined promises? that God has made for those who receive him and who have been given power to become the sons of God. How many of you believe that there are some predetermined promises that belong to those of you who are becoming sons of God? Amen? You believe that? I'm talking about predetermined things. If, if you didn't know before, I want you to know now as we move forward that there are some things that pertain to your spirit life that have already been settled in heaven. There are certain, uh, th there are certain promises that are very powerful that have been predetermined and heaven is not at war over these promises that I'm talking about. They are simply yes and amen. They are already established. They are already available. But too many times we insert a maybe where God has already placed a definite yes. We, we insert maybe that'll happen for me or maybe that'll take place in my life or maybe that won't come my, my direction when all the time there are certain predetermined promises that are powerful for believers who have been given power to become the sons of God that there is not a battle over because uh, at, we, you know, here a couple of years ago, maybe a year and a half or so ago, we went on a several week journey and we, we talked about three words that Jesus said as he hung on the cross, it is finished. Come on, say that with me. It is finished. You, you need to understand that that phrase right there, it is finished. There are certain things that have already been obtained for you through the blood of Jesus Christ. It is nothing that you can do. There's not anything you have to add to it. There is already some predetermined powerful promises that are yours, but your life has to come in alignment with that promise. In other words, you have to agree that the promise is available for you before you'll ever see it come to pass in your life. Amen. Now, look, I, I intended uh, I, I intended to deal with a different uh, subject tonight, but I, I feel uh, led to take a little deeper the thought that I dealt with on Sunday morning in particular, uh, the tendency that all of us have at one time or another to begin to believe that nothing is going right in our life, and we start asking questions, why, right? Right? 
we all have this tendency. Everybody has this tendency to, to get to a certain place and a certain point in life to where uh, we, we begin to question things that are happening in our life. We begin to question circumstances that are coming up in our life. We begin to uh, believe that nothing is, is going to be made right. Nothing's going to go right. I'm not going to be able to ever uh, have victory in my life, that I'm not ever going to be better than what I am right now. Nothing's ever going to change. Everything is turned in a negative uh, way toward me, and, and I'm not able to to seem to move forward in my life. We talked about on Sunday not quitting, and, and I just want to take it just a little further here because I think that all of us at some point go through a period of life where we feel like the weight that is pressing in on us is greater than our capacity to carry it. Amen? We all go through these times in life, and let me just reiterate, we all go through times in life where uh, the, the weight that is pressing in on us from just, just living life sometimes seems greater than what I am able to carry. I think there's probably, if everyone would be honest in here tonight, every person has had probably had that moment in your life to where uh, the, the, the weight that you're carrying creates questions in your life. But I believe that Paul knew a little bit about what I'm talking about here to you tonight. And I believe that Paul had the same questions that many of us have at times. But I believe that Paul, in the middle of his questioning, was able to settle some things uh, with some other questions. I, I read Romans 8, 31 through 39, and in that reading tonight, it wasn't just uh, sending out a lot of facts to you. It wasn't just uh, uh, reading a certain phrase to you over and over and over again. But Paul had dealt with some things, and, and he dealt with some things all through seven chapters of the book of Romans. And when he gets to the eighth chapter of the book of Romans, he, he begins to talk about in the first chapter, he talks about uh, the condition that the world was in. And let me tell you, the world of Paul's day was in, in as bad a condition as the world of our day. Paul began to talk about not only the world, but then he began to talk about how some in the church wouldn't, uh, would, wouldn't line up and some wouldn't do right. And he began to list all of those things. He began to talk about justification. He began to talk about sanctification. He began to talk about what it means to be in Christ. He began to talk about the sacrifice that Christ made for us. He, Paul, how many of you, I, I know you're familiar with this scripture because Paul got over there in the seventh chapter of the book of Romans and he began to deal with this ideology that, that there's a war going on inside of me Two dogs are fighting inside of me. There, there's a good side and there's a bad side. And some days I feed the good side and some days I feed the bad side. Come on, everything's going to be all right, everybody right here. It's some, some, days, some days I don't know which dog I fed. And Paul made this declaration in Romans chapter 7. He said, man, there's evil and there's good. And, and then he said, the, the days that I want to do good, evil jumps on me. And the evil that I don't want to do, I can't seem to find the, the power to resist it. And I keep finding myself in these places. And, and he goes on and he says, and when I'm right in the middle of this, there's a question that pops up in my mind because the weight that I'm carrying seems too heavy for me and I'm not sure I'm ever going to get out of this. And there's a question that comes to my mind and Paul posed the question in chapter 7 and he said, who shall deliver me from this wretched man? But then he goes on and he says something and he answered the question and he said, thank God Jesus Christ always causes us to triumph. Thank God he, see, Paul had questions, but what he did, he'd turn around and say something to his questions. He'd turn around and question his questions. I know I'm not making any sense. Y'all are looking at me like dogs with new pans tonight, huh? Watch this. You, you, you see, he settled a lot of the questions that he had about his own life. Man, think about that. There's, there's something powerful about the life of Paul. I believe that the reason that there's so much focus on the life of Paul is because you have to understand there's something powerful about Paul's life because until Paul had an encounter with Jesus Christ, until he had an encounter with the Spirit of a living God, Paul was killing people who believe what you and I believe. I know we don't like it, especially in the world we're living in. I know I'm going to make some of your toenails curl right now. But Paul, but Paul was a terrorist named Saul. He was killing and beheading Christians and having them locked up. He was holding their, he was, he was having them stoned and he would hold the coats of the people that would stone them to death. Paul was a terrorist. Paul 
Paul stands as a living witness and testimony that if God can turn that life around, God can turn any life around. And not only did God turn his life around, but God used him to write over half of the New Testament and he reached an entire Gentile uh, group of people that would have never been reached had it not been for Paul being obedient. But Paul uh, suffered some things in his life. Paul suffered because of some of his own actions. Paul suffered because the Jewish people didn't want to accept him. Paul suffered because there were places he went to present Jesus Christ and the gospel of Christ and they didn't want to hear it. Paul was shipwrecked. Paul was beaten. Paul was thrown in jail. Paul was done harm by his enemies. Paul was done harm by his friends. And yet every time Paul thought he wasn't going to make it, Paul would rise up and look his questions in the face and ask them a question and say, who is is going to separate me from the love of God. Who, who's going to separate me from the love of God? Watch this. See, Paul, uh, I, I may not know. One of the things I get from reading Paul, I like Paul because he seemed to be, uh, he had a quality that I like, and it was Transparency. He didn't try to hide his issues. In fact, he came right out and put them in a book so you could read about them. And he made this comment. He said, man, I, I, had, a, I had such a bad issue that I prayed three times for God to take it away. And finally, God told me, shut up. My grace is sufficient for you. Now get back out there and do what I've been telling you to do. See, some of you spend so much time worrying about your weakness it's, it's your worry about your weakness that keeps you sidelined and the enemy keeps you out of the game because you're worrying about your weakness and I'm getting ahead of myself, but God understands your weakness and he's saying, if you can give me your weakness, my strength can be made perfect in your weakness. But while you're sitting over here worried about what you need to do is rise up and say something to your weakness and say my weakness will, it doesn't give you a right to continue to live a life of sin knowing what the word of God says just because you want to live it that way. But when you're struggling with something that's not the time to quit that's the time to rise up and look at your question in the eye and say who is going to separate me because greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world am I making any sense so I, I, I like Paul because he's transparent I like him because he put it out there and, and one of the things that Paul one of the things that Paul did that I like was he was honest about the fact that he didn't know everything. Amen. Now, there's a section at the refuge, and I won't point it out tonight, but there's a section where all the know-it-alls sit. Amen. Look straight ahead. Nobody will know I'm talking about your section. Hallelujah. Look, but Paul said, he didn't come right out and say it like I'm saying it. But there were times that Paul let it be known that he didn't have all the answers. And you see, I don't know if you guys realize this or not. I'm, I'm going to be a little, I'm going to be a little Paulinian here tonight. I'm going to be transparent, and I'm going to tell you because I'm sure you didn't know this, but I have problems. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm beginning to think the longer I pastor here, that they're more leaning to the mental health side. Is what I'm beginning to. That's called transparency. Amen. That's called transparency. So, so I, I do have issues. I have problems that I deal with and that I struggle with. And there are days that uh, I get up and there are some days, you know, that, that I have clarity about my situations. And then there are other days that I have cloudiness about my situations. And I, I may not know everything about my problems, but there are some things that I do know in the midst of my problems that help me survive my problems. 
Paul said 2 Timothy 1 and 12, he said this, 2 Timothy 1 and 12, for this reason I also suffer these things and nevertheless I'm not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. I may not know the answer to all my problems. I may not know what tomorrow holds, but I know who holds tomorrow. I may not know what I'm going to do, but I know in whom I have believed. So even in the midst of all my questions, when I may not know everything I do know something and I know in whom I have believed so, sometimes you may not know what to believe I mean some really seriously sometimes you don't know what to believe I love it when I'm talking to multiple people about the same subject and they all have a different story because I have to sit there and tell them Blake, I don't know who to believe. Don't know what to believe. You're saying this. You're saying this. You're saying this. Something is something, 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 something isn't right here. And what you need to, what you need to understand is, I'm smart enough to know that if all three of y'all were there and all three of you have a different story, somebody's are lying to me. Amen. Now, I, you know, I've heard those stories before about like kids when they were growing up, you know, and they parents had a bunch of kids and one of the kids would do something wrong and the parents weren't there to see which one done it wrong so they just line them all up and bust them all to make sure they got the right one all right we'll see but the difference in that and my heavenly father is he knows <laughs> he knows and so here here's the thing you sometimes in life sometimes in life things are happening to you and happening, you know, you may, listen, let's, let's just be real here tonight. Let's be real. Let's be honest. You may not know why you lost your job. Now, let's also be honest. You may know. I mean, there's two sides. But you, sometimes, sometimes you just may not know. I have a friend uh, that I grew up with, and, and she's with her family in, in Florida this week, and they're on vacation, but she, she, she has two boys, and she took them to a movie today, and one of her posts on Facebook, she said, last year when we came, they go to the same resort in, in Florida every year for a vacation. They like it there, and they go every year, and she posted today that they were going in this movie theater, and she said, last year when we came into this movie theater, my phone rang, and I got a phone call from my job. Now, here she is on vacation, but I got a phone call while I was on vacation from my job telling me that I was being laid off. You know, hey, happy vacation. Enjoy the rest of your stay. <laughs> Hope you bought traveler's insurance because, <laughs> you know. And, uh, she's, and she said today on, on her post, she said, guaranteed if my phone rings today, I'm not answering it. <laughs> right? Because just the way the world works, you know, uh, Maybe you don't know why you got laid off. Maybe you don't know why uh, in a recession you, you lost your house. Or maybe you don't know why under certain circumstances that your children are wigging out. Maybe you don't understand all of that. Maybe you don't understand that, that uh, why certain things. Maybe you don't understand why you got a disease and other people didn't get a disease. Maybe you don't understand why you got caught up in something that other people didn't get caught up in. Maybe you don't know the answer to some of those questions. You may not know what to believe or what to think about certain situations. But I came to tell you tonight, as long as you know in whom you believe, you can make it. Because if you know who you believe in, then no matter what, what is happening around you, you have the understanding that my, my foundation is not built on things. My foundation is not built on my job. My job is not my source. My children aren't the source of my joy or my happiness. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The Lord is my provision. My health is not my peace. The Lord is my peace. So no matter if I can't answer all the questions, I'm going to say something to my questions and I'm going to tell them, great and and greatly to be praised is the God in whom I have believed. 
and I can make it. I had a man sit in my office on Monday. I'm trying to hurry. But I, but I had a man sit in my office on Monday and ask me this question. Why can't God be a little more clear about what he wants and what I need to do? You can tell by your laughter that most of you identify with that statement. Amen. We, he, he said, you know, why is it that it's just not a little more clear? Because you and I would like everything to be reduced to a simple black and white theological scripture and verse debate. Because I'd like, every time something happens in my life, I'd like to be able to turn to James chapter 1 verses 14. And like rubbing the magic genie lamp, get an answer. Hello? I would, I would, you know, I'd, oh man. My, my child is acting like a knucklehead today. Oh good. Matthew chapter 5 verses 6 and 7 <laughs> tell you exactly how. My husband walked out on me today. Oh good. 1 Corinthians 4, 7. You know, we, we, you know we, we'd like to be able... Here, and here, you know, let me, let me just tell you something. I, I, I want to tell you this. I'm trying to be really nice here right now. But what, I, I, need, I need you to understand something here. Um, this, this is not how... Watch this. This is not how you read your Bible. Uh, God, I need a word. I don't like that. Let's see if I can find myself in the concordance here. Man, that's not it. Listen, we, we want God to be clear, but we don't want to read with intention. Y'all not talking to me. I don't care. Hallelujah. I'm saved. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We, we want everything to be spelled out just so for us and and i listen to me i know i can tell tonight man there's some super spiritual people here uh, there there are some of you waiting for baptism to happen because you're going to walk up to the tank and count how many sins are floating in the in the top of the water and you're going to judge your life like that you're going to be like i knew i wasn't as bad as them listen listen if there's anything floating in the top, it's because Corey didn't wipe the bottom out. It's from, it's left over from you. And, and I know that I'm dealing with some very spiritual people in here tonight. But I don't care if you're so spiritual that you glow in the dark. Sometimes you just have to throw your hands up and be honest and say, I don't have a clue as to what's going on, but I know what I know, what I know, and what I know is God is good and he can't be any other way. So I refuse to blame him for anything that's happening in my life. Because evil is not part of his character. Sometimes my questions are more than my answers. But would you let me speak to your heart and spirit? Man, I, I need to tell you this. Oh, let me hurry. <laughs> tell you that I, I believe there's hope found in God's word. That if nothing else, it'll lift you to a place where you can at least rise above the turbulence of your current situation and get an understanding that no matter what I'm feeling, sensing, or seeing, there is peace beyond my storm. Yeah. Now look, uh, whenever we were gone, on our, on our way home from visiting my family in Oregon, we boarded the aircraft in Portland on last t Tuesday a week ago. We boarded the aircraft at 2.30 Pacific time and we got a non-stop flight back to DF or to Dallas Love Field and uh, 
we're ready to get home. It's been a long week. We're ready to get home. And so we get in the plane. Everybody gets going. And we get out on the runway. And we taxi. And we take off. And the plane is still in the ascending pattern. And uh, the pilot comes on the loudspeaker. I don't know, whatever they call that thing. This year pilot up in the cabin. Why they try to act so cool? Have you ever seen pilots? Most of them are like Poindexter, got the little thing in there, there. But they sound cool on the radio. This is your pilot up in the cabin, and we're just going to let you know we're going to keep that seatbelt sign fastened because uh, we just came in from uh, Phoenix. This plane just came in from Phoenix, and on the way into Portland, we got into a little, because it was raining when we left, we got into a little storm on the way into Portland, and that storm's still hovering out here. So we want you guys to know that we're about to put the thrusters to this bad boy. And we're going to shoot through this storm because we, we've already come through it on, on this other side of it, and, and we know how high we have to get to get above the turbulence and to get above this storm. And so we just want you guys to sit back, relax, hold on. Uh, it's going to get bumpy for a few minutes, but we promise you we're going to get you through it. And they shot the throttle to it. And when they shot the throttle to it, that plane began to rattle and shake violently. And Rosanna started grabbing me. And I was like, didn't you hear them? Get your own mask. <laughs> we ain't got no time for that. Every man for himself. <laughs> yeah. I'm just kidding. She got nervous, and I started laughing at her. And I said, why are you nervous? And she said, I don't know. Because she Rosanna's a, a worldwide traveler. She's she's been uh, she's been all over the place, and been out of the country, been been on long distance flights. Man, this was nothing but a little three and a half hour flight. And she said, "I don't know." She said, "It just always makes me nervous when we get in turbulence." And I mean, the plane was banging pretty good. It was rocking pretty good, and and she was she was hanging on to me. And I, man, for a minute there, I thought I was back in the old Pentecostal church because her. <laughs> yeah. Y'all don't know what I'm talking about, cause I, 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 I man, Clint for for a minute. I mean, her face was shaking. I felt like getting her chin and going, "You got it, sister. You got it." Just, cause that's what they used to do to you in the Pentecost church when you were getting filled with the Holy Ghost. They'd get your chin, shake it, cause if you couldn't speak in tongues on your own, they were gonna help you do it. Hallelujah. Now y'all, y'all are nervous. <laughs> I'm telling you, don't ever get in the spirit. Don't ever get close in this church and your chin start shaking, cause I'm coming after you. Hallelujah. But that thing was rattling and it was banging away and she's grabbing onto my hand and I'm, I'm looking out the window and, and man, we're going, we're just busting through the clouds and it wasn't, but just a few minutes later, bam, we pierced through that last layer of clouds. The sun came out, that plane stopped shaking, that pilot leveled it out and we flew home the smoothest flight you could have. From that point on, we flew home. You say, why are you telling us that? Because I want you to know, sometimes in life, it's like being in that plane where the storms are turbulent and you feel like everything is shaken and you feel like everything might fall apart. But I came to tell you tonight that if I, I know this, I, can, I have experienced this, I can tell you this, that if you can bow yourself a little lower in prayer and just kind of put the thrusters through it and just move on above the clouds, there is peace and there is joy on the other side of your storm but you got to get through this mess to get to that and sometimes you got to look at your storm and say I may not have the answer for you but I am getting out of you you got to say something you got to say something to your storm amen look and I'm trying I'm trying to close trying to hurry and the way that you do that in your spirit, the way you do that in your spirit is through the Word of God. Because the Word of God forces me to remember who I am. 
and a recognition of my identity is enough all by itself to keep me out of certain things. Y'all not with me. I said a recognition of who I am. That recognition in and of itself is enough to keep me out. I didn't say to keep you out of everything. But it's enough to keep you out of some things. Now, my, my kids probably didn't always, well, I know they didn't always obey this. But when they would leave, we, you know, Roseanne and I, we have told them a time or two, remember who you are. Right? telling you the thing that makes me preach long is when people look at me crazy because when they look at me crazy i feel like i need to explain it more better even if you don't understand what i'm saying look like it i'll get i'll get through this but we we tell our kids from time to time hey when you go out there wherever you you know where that place you you better remember who you are because man i i couldn't give my kids a whole lot growing up but i tried to give them a good name and maybe some of you didn't have that luxury, or maybe some of you didn't do that for your kids. I don't know, whatever. But Roseanne and I didn't have a whole lot of money. We didn't have a whole lot of this or that. But we tried to live our life in a way that when, when people saw us and knew us, that, that uh, it wasn't like turn the other direction and run. Here they come! <sighs> so remember who you are. And I'm telling you, if you get in the Word of God, and if you stay in the Word of God, the Word of God will point out your identity in Jesus Christ. And your identity in Jesus Christ, remembering who you are. Uh, listen, I know this for a fact, that remembering who I am has kept me out of some situations and some messes and some games and some dramas and some traumas that I may not know. You know, I, I may not have known what it was all up to then, but after I got through it, I looked back and said, man, I am sure glad I realized who I was before I stepped off into that because the recognition of who I am in Christ kept me out of some jams in my life. Does anybody know what I'm saying in here? Sometimes you have to look at your situation and say something and say, nope, 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 nope. I know who I am in Christ and nothing shall separate me. I'm not getting into that situation. I'm not, I'm not getting into that situation. I'm not allowing that. See, but some of you are too easily persuaded. To go back into your old habits. But whose I am causes me to carry myself different than the rest of the world. Whose I am causes me to carry myself different than the rest of the world. Mm. Man, I can say a whole lot here. I'm trying to hurry. Whose I am, who I belong to causes me to carry myself different. Larry, why don't you get involved in every political debate on social media because of whose I am? Larry, don't you ever have a comment about anything? Oh, absolutely. I just keep it all in my head. Because <laughs> my comments never save the world or change the world. But, but I have seen some comments cause some people to be separated. And I have seen some people choose to, to, to pick fights and stuff that they don't need to be picking fights over. And, I, I, and, and man, man, because, see, what are you saying, Larry? I'm saying that who I belong to causes me to stay out of certain messes. I got some, listen, uh, y'all need to turn that off for a minute back there. We're going to go on a Facebook break. And, uh, <laughs> but I don't feel the need to get involved in all that. Hello? I don't have to comment on how everybody raises their children. You know, ain't nobody wanting to talk to me right now. Whose I am keeps me out of messes. 
Because when I remember whose I am, I, I just remember, man, Jesus opened not his mouth. This is my favorite pose. <laughs> Wish some of you'd pick it up. Hallelujah. <laughs> Did I say that? Did it? That, that one didn't stay in my head. I'm sorry. You have to, I, I, don't, I don't know everything, but I do know this. I belong to one who has it all in his hands. And when I can't trust you, I can trust him. Man, you know why some of you are so confused? Because you ask everybody on your... You, you have something going on in your life, and so you put it out on Facebook, and you ask a question, what should I do? And then you wonder why you're confused, because 14,000 people give you an answer to what you should do, and out of 14,000 people, there's 16,000 answers. Now, you do the math on that, because 2,000 of them changed their mind several times and had to go back and rewrite and you wonder why you're confused. And you wonder why you can't get clarity in your life. Man, you need to quit asking everybody around you. Listen, there, there ought to be one or two people in your life that you have confidence in them, in their walk. Listen, if, if you don't have confidence in somebody's walk with the Lord, you don't need to be asking them Jack Diddley yeah. about your spirit life. You don't need to be asking them anything. What you need to do is get in the Word of God. Remember who you are. And if you'll remember who you are, you'll be reminded that you're His. And if you're a king's kid, He will not allow reproach to come to His name in your life. And so if He hadn't fixed it yet, He will fix it soon. Everybody goes through stuff. Am I doing okay? Yeah. Watch this. Everybody goes through stuff. And a lot of people survive. But many survivors spend all their life remembering how bad it was and how wrong it was. But there is a place that you can go to in God where you can walk through the fire and not even smell like smoke. I'm going to tell you what. I'm, I know this makes some of you uncomfortable. But I have a hard time spending a whole lot of time with people who can't ever get over anything. It's not that I'm not compassionate. It just drains me. Man. Look, you're not the only one. I've often wondered why I never get a chance to cry. Like when I start, people come to my office and cry about their life. Then when I start crying, all of a sudden they got to go. I've never. I'm, hey, Larry, thanks for your time. I'll, I'll get back to you. I think I'm going to start doing that. Look, I can't, man. There's some people, they made it through what it was they came through, but you can smell the situation all over them. You can smell it all over them. Man, there, listen, ah, there's some people, men and women, I started to just say women, but I want to be an equal opportunity offender. But there, there, are, there are men and women that go through uh, horrible marriages and divorces, but, but many of them survive them, but many of them remain angry. And they become men haters or women haters. And they compare every man to the one that they got away from or every woman to the one that did them wrong. Let me tell you something. You're building your own prison with that kind of mentality. And that's, that's still... Oh. I don't know. I'm tired of smelling smoke is what I'm trying to tell you. Paul at the end of his life from a prison cell, wrote to the Philippian church in Philippians chapter 4, verse 11. Watch this. Paul said this, but each one is tempted. No, 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 no. Philippians. Uh, that's James. There we go. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. 
There are some people that have no idea how to just be content. You, you get around people who are not ever satisfied. Ever. 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 Not ever content. God blesses them with a new car. And they complain because they can't drive a stick. <laughs> Hello? People do, people do things and they're not ever content. Paul said, listen, and, and let me just say this to you. If you're looking for somebody or something to bring you happiness in life, you'll never find happiness. You'll never find it because they'll always move the carrot. You'll always be chasing something you can't obtain. And if you, if you think somebody else, I, I, I've told people this before. You, it, people say this all the time and it drives me up the slap crazy wall. If you've never seen a slap crazy wall, <laughs> go out in the hall and look up. It kind of looks like that. But it drives me crazy when people say, I'm just looking for someone to complete me. Listen to me. The scripture, this is this how I know you don't know who you are. Because the scripture says you are complete in Jesus Christ. The scripture doesn't say it takes another person to complete you. You are already complete in Jesus Christ. And if you can't be happy with you and Jesus, you won't be happy with you and Jesus and Jimmy. Sorry for all the Jimmys in here. Or Jerry or whoever. You have to learn. Oh, I need to get this into you right now. He said, he said, I've learned whatever state I am to be content. And we all love to quote this scripture, but this is the context in which this scripture was taken, Philippians 4.13. He said, I've learned to be content because I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. We like to quote that one, but we don't like to quote the one about being content. Sometimes you have to be content when you don't have all the answers. Sometimes you have to be content when you don't have all the money. Sometimes you have to be content when your kids are messing up and when your house is a wreck and when you don't know what you're going to do and when sickness has come to your life you have to say even in this I can do all things through Christ even in this now watch this I I'm closing I'm done Paul said Paul said I've learned go back to 411 watch this I, I love this thank you I don't mean to be bossy thank you didn't mean to say I'm bossy not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned. You know what that says right there? Maybe you read over that and you don't understand, or you, you read it and didn't let it digest. What that means is Paul went through a period in his life to where he wasn't content. He said contentment wasn't a natural attribute. I had to learn how to be content. I had to learn. You have to train yourself. When life is throwing you questions, you have to train yourself to say something and say, even if I don't have the answers, I'm content in Jesus Christ. Man, it takes practice. I'm oh, it takes practice to be content. Because you're doing everything you know to do that's right, and everything around you, Dustin, is falling apart. And then you look down the street at those old janky neighbors. They ain't living right. They ain't trying to live right. And it looks to you from the outside like they got it better than what you got it. And you start thinking, man, I just might as well. No, no. That's when you need to stand up and say something to your questions. Man, I'm preaching good. Hallelujah. Paul had questions, but he was a learner. You might have questions, but learners know how to ask the right questions. Too many of us, too many of us. Can you put up there, Leah, Romans 8, 29? I'm, I'm just go back to a scripture I read in, in the beginning. Romans 8, 29 says this. For whom he foreknew, 
he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brethren whom he foreknew he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son there are too many of us come on magicians musicians I'm done but there, there are too many of us who are using excuses about our life a life as to why you can't or won't become what God intends you to be. But Paul says in Romans 8, 29, that he knew you before you got here. You didn't get it. He knew you before you got here. Rosanna and I were flipping through the channels the other day, just sitting in the living room. I'm telling you right now, this, this story, I'm stealing this because it was so good. We were flipping through the channels. We don't like watch a lot of Christian television. Most of it gives me the heebie-jeebies. But there's a lot of weird stuff in things but I, we were flipping through the other day and as I was flipping through I saw a guy preaching that I'm, I'm really drawn to and so I stopped and, and listened and he said something I'm not preaching his message tonight but he said something that I had never ever thought about and he was preaching about the story of Judas betraying Jesus and he began to talk about the fact how many of you know that at the last supper all that kind of stuff here everybody look right here they're just your kids you've seen them before right here but he was talking about the fact that at the last supper Jesus gets up to wash the disciples' feet. Everybody remember that story? He gets up to wash the disciples' feet. And when he gets up to wash their feet, he tells all of them, all of them, go read this for yourself. But he tells them in the Gospels, I'm about to do this. But 11 of you are clean. But there's one in here that's unclean. But I'm going to wash all of your feet for the sake of the one. Now think about this. He said, you're all clean except for one, but I'm going to wash all your feet to make you clean. And I'm going to do that to all 11 of you, so I don't, or to all 12 of you, so I don't have to single the one out. But think about it. Man, this was mind-blowing to me. And this, this guy I really respect, and he said, do you think it's possible? No matter what you've been told all your life, he said, do you think it was possible? He really blew my mind. And I'm going to blow yours. He said, I'm not going to be surprised if I get to heaven and Judas is there. He said, because basically what Jesus was telling him, I'm forgiving you before you even commit the act. Y'all not hearing me now, hallelujah. I didn't know I was going to use that tonight, but it, it kind of fits with what I'm telling you here because Paul said, whom he, whom he foreknew, he predestined. And some of you are using mistakes that you've made in your life and you're using the conditions of your life and you're using where you came from for why you won't step up and be the man or the woman that God intended for you to be and wants you to be. And what I believe he sent me here to tell you tonight was he knew all that stuff about you before we ever got to 2016. And if he knew it about you and he still called you, then what's keeping you on the sideline? If he can forgive you, you need to forgive you. Mm. 
So if all that's true, Paul said in Romans 8, 31, then tell me something. What shall we say to these things? I love that. Paul stood up. He had all these questions. And Carl, he looked at his questions. And he said, what shall we say to all these things? In other words, Paul said, I got something to say to my questions. And then he just started rattling it off. Who? I'll tell you what questions. You, you, you're creating problems and questions in my life, but I'm going to tell you something. Who? Let me ask you something. Who's going to separate me from the love of Christ? Shall height or depth? Anybody with me tonight? Shall any of these things separate me? No. Listen, I think I've discovered that the reason many of us don't live as overcomers is because we don't know what to say to the things that come into our lives. Things, questions come into our life and we don't know what to say. And because we don't know what to say, we get overwhelmed. And because we get overwhelmed, we give up. And because we give up, we get mad at God. And because we get mad at God, we wander away from the kingdom. Because we don't know what to say. And we act like we're the first ones that never knew what to say. But Paul said this in the same chapter of the book of Romans, chapter number 8. Paul said, that's why it's important that you have a relationship with the Holy Spirit. Because when you don't know what to say, the Holy Spirit itself will say something through you with groanings and utterings that you may not even be able to put words to. But when you don't know what to say, the Spirit knows what to say through you. When you don't have answers for your questions in life, the Spirit of God has some questions for your questions. So if God be for me, who can be against me? I may not have an answer to every question in my life. I may go to sleep some nights with tears in my eyes and heaviness in my spirit. But I know what I know. And so because I know what I know, though weeping may last for a night, I know that joy is coming in the morning. Because no matter what questions I'm facing, I also have a question to ask. Who shall separate me from the love of Jesus Christ? Amen? Who is going to separate me from the love of Jesus Christ? Stand with me.